Hey there, dear friends, it's Drake again. On Crime Story Diaries, the case of 18-year-old Ana Maria Serrano shook the citizens of Mexico and Colombia, especially because this tragedy stemmed from a controlling romantic relationship. Ana Maria Serrano was an ambitious, yet naive medical student in her second month of studying at the university when catastrophe struck. On the gloomy Tuesday of September 12, 2023, her lifeless body was discovered inside her own home. Despite living with her parents, they happened to be away on that fateful day her corpse was found. The reason for their absence was that on September 8, 2023, Maria's parents embarked on a journey across Europe to celebrate their wedding anniversary. At the time of the unspeakable events, they were outside the country. Maria's father, the esteemed Jose Serrano, and her beloved mother, the charming Mrs. Jimena Kispides, had been wed for 23 blissful years. During their travels, they planned to connect with their eldest daughter, who was furthering her studies abroad in Germany. Young Anna Maria was originally meant to join in the family excursion. However, due to the start of her ambitious studies and impending evaluations, it was mutually decided that it would be best for her to remain home alone and concentrate on preparing for the pivotal exams. Their home was located in a pleasant and tranquil neighborhood within the city of Atizapan de Zaragoza, allowing Anna Maria to reside alone with only occasional visits from her housekeeper. Consequently, from evening until dawn, the girl experienced solitude within the four walls of her family's residence. Understandably concerned for her daughter's welfare during this lonesome period, Mrs. Jimena Caspedes frequently communicated with Anna Maria through letters ensuring all was well. This unprecedented span of independent living marked the first such experience for the youth. Consistent with her mother's wishes for security, Anna Maria routinely alerted Mrs. Cespedes of her plans and companions. On that day, Anna Maria informed her mother that she had arrived home, which the housekeeper confirmed. Meanwhile, it was the late hour of two in the European morning when Mr. Jose Serrano was startled from slumber by an unknown phone number. Awakened by her husband's movement, Mrs. Jimena promptly asked if the call originated from their daughter, though Jose explained the call came from an unrecognized source. His wife could not quell her disquiet and thus messaged Anna Maria at several minutes past two, inquiring if she had yet fallen asleep. Anna Maria replied that she wasn't and that she was playing with the dog. After several minutes had passed with no further communication from her daughter, Jimena grew increasingly concerned by Anna Maria's unusual response. While she typically wrote with clarity and brevity, her latest message expressed exhaustion through complicated phrases that her mother had never seen her use before. Doubting the sincerity of her claim to be merely tired, Jimena pleaded with Anna Maria to call so they could speak directly. However, her daughter's next reply cut deeply. Through solemn prose laden with emotion, she bid a final farewell to both parents. No amount of questioning could persuade Anna Maria to elaborate on what had driven her to such desperation. After sending one last message assuring her mother of her love, all contact suddenly ceased, leaving Jimena with an overwhelming sense of foreboding for her daughter's well-being. Upon receiving her daughter's frantic messages, Mrs. Jimena urgently summoned their neighbor to check on Anna Maria, concerned for her well-being. Gaining entry through the backyard door left ajar, he swiftly marched inside and was stricken by the gruesome scene that awaited. There laid the girl's lifeless frame, beyond saving. Wasted no time in informing the grieving parents, he hastily phoned the authorities. Responding promptly, Police poured in and launched their investigation into the disturbing discovery. While the initial assumption was that in a moment of despair, Anna Maria had tragically taken her own life with curtains from her bedroom in a fit of anguish, a deeper probe soon revealed a more sinister truth. Delving into her digital correspondence and scrutinizing surveillance footage illuminated activities on that fateful day, exposing this was no voluntary departure but rather a heinous crime with all evidence indicating her vengeful ex-boyfriend as the perpetrator. According to the footage captured by the surveillance cameras installed at Anna Maria Serrano's abode on the 12th of September in the year 2023, a mysterious fellow, 
dressed entirely in ebony garments and bearing a cap and mask, made three distinct appearances at the domicile of the young lady in question. His initial visit occurred in the deepest hours of the night preceding the tragic events, around three in the morning, arriving alone in a vehicle devoid of any identifying plates. The next entry was made at the hour of one in the afternoon of the ensuing day, though fate would have it that the girl was elsewhere at that moment. On this occasion, only the domestic attendant was within the residence, engaged in their cleaning duties, and the intruder reappeared driving the same auto, yet surprisingly with license plates affixed. He arrived at the familiar dwelling and inquired as to whether Anna was present, but the employee replied in the negative, stating that protocol prevented entry as the residents were absent. The gentleman persisted, arguing that he solely wished to deliver a trinket for Anna. Regardless of the employee's refusal, he at last exited. At precisely 6 p.m. on September 12th, he again pulled up to the abode in the identical automobile, and this transpired when the employee had already vacated, leaving Anna Maria alone inside. Despite concealing his visage during all three calls, the employee was able to identify him. It was Anna's ex-love, Alan Hill Romero. Owing to the employee's testimony, investigators focused their efforts on the gentleman and centered the investigation around his relationship with Anna, suspecting that he harbored a motivation for committing the crime. Alan Hill Romero had known Anna Maria and her close-knit family for many years as they were fellow classmates in school. However, the two did not develop deep affection until approximately a year and a half before the girl's untimely demise. They embarked on a romantic partnership in November 2021 and were intensely devoted to one another for 18 months. Anna's mother recounted that during this time frame, their bond appeared profoundly tender and their rapport seemed blissful. Both sets of parents occasionally allowed the teenagers to lodge overnight at each other's dwellings, trustful in their prudence. Although the parents were prudent about leaving adolescents unattended, they had faith in them as the pair excelled academically and envisioned auspicious prospects for their futures. Thus, the mothers and fathers permitted the continuation of this fleeting first love. Everything seemed tranquil until Anna Maria realized with mounting dismay that Alan had started to control every minute facet of her life. He persistently fabricated scenes of unfounded jealousy and limited her interactions with individuals he disapproved of in an attempt to isoalt her. This inevitably led to their separation in June 2023, three months preceding the girl's demise. Throughout the separation, Anna Maria confided in Alan that now their schooling had been completed and she would be pursuing higher education, it made little sense to continue the association, as it had already ceased developing. She also underscored that the physical separation wouldn't be sustainable. However, Alan wasn't willing to surrender with ease and persevered in attempting to schedule encounters with her. He unrelentingly conveyed messages to her and delivered gifts to her domicile demonstrably expending effort into striving to rekindle the relationship with Anna Maria. His attempts to reconnect varied from grand romantic gestures to humble acts of service, but she remained resolute in her decision to end their time together. Still, Alan clung to the hope that distance would not destroy what they once shared. However, the determined girl strived to permanently end their communication once and for all. She confided in her mother regarding every detail. At that time, Senora Jimena believed Alan's behavior was ordinary and even advised her daughter to reconsider, seeing him as an intelligent and good man. She could not fathom that he could be discourteous to her daughter. In reality, many found accepting their breakup difficult. Teachers and friends from both Alan and Anna Maria's families considered the pair the perfect match as they grew up together, were the top students in their school and generally excelled in all areas. Nevertheless, their paths diverged, and the girl swiftly realized this, wanting to terminate the relationship. However, Alan refused to acknowledge it. As noted earlier, surveillance footage captured Alan shortly before the crime transpired. The day preceding the crime, when Alan entered Anna Maria's residence, 
Her laptop was stolen. She informed her parents about it and assumed it may have been left at her grandmother's home, as she had recently visited. Investigators saw through this and deduced that Alan likely intentionally broke into the lone girl's house, knowing nobody was present, to steal the laptop. Furthermore, Alan keenly understood the family's schedule, being aware that her parents were away on a trip. He had visited the house several times previously and knew their small dog was allowed to roam freely in the backyard, since the door was often left unbolted. Investigators discovered Alan exploited this familiarity, stealing the laptop with intentions of scrutinizing Anna Maria's communiques to extract further intimacies about her life. After inspecting the laptop, law enforcement theorized that while perusing Anna Maria's social media exchanges, Alan encountered something triggering unmanageable fury and possessiveness. These messages unveiled Anna Maria had entered a new romance with somebody from her university. Anna Maria consistently shared all aspects of her existence with her parents, so they had been cognizant of her budding relationship. However, this information enraged Alan, causing him to immediately send her threatening messages in a burst of emotion. In these messages, his words came rapid fire, demanding that she delete photos with the new guy by nine in the evening or face dire consequences. An air of menace hung heavy in his tone as he insistently demanded a reply from her. In a moment, Alan's gentle nature transformed as his psyche spiraled into a place of hostility and possession. Soon, his messages grew more foreboding and unbalanced in tone. Sensing real danger, Anna confided her fears to trusted friends, telling them in a shuddering voice that if anything should happen to her, Alan must be the one held responsible. As evidence of her deep unease, Anna forwarded their unsettling exchange to prove she harbored legitimate safety concerns. At this fragile time, her parents lay many miles distant, unable to shelter and reassure her Vidya fact of which Alan was perceptively aware. Investigators later proposed that in the throes of such tumult, Alan's mind began to machinate vengeance using Anna's laptop, seeing opportunity in his knowledge of her home's lax security and surveillance blind spots. Furthermore, Anna Maria's murder was meticulously planned down to precise knowledge of when the house cleaner's schedule would leave her alone and vulnerable. Adding to the tragic circumstances, even the family pet failed to sound alarm at the intruder's unlawful entrance, suggesting disturbing familiarity. Forensic examination highlighted similarities between this crime and a past theft, intimating premeditation in the manner of entry. The autopsy findings cemented this was no accident or suicide, but vicious assault. Mechanical asphyxiation caused by external neck compression ended her young life, as evidenced by the telltale mark. The use of a solid object made self-infliction through rope highly implausible, confirming this was no rash act, but a calculated silencing of potential testimony. Though her mobile was with her lifeless body, the message she supposedly sent originating from another device, not her own phone, poking further holes in any story of deliberate solitary demise. Together, these discoveries reinforced the hypothesis that Alan cruelly stole her future and tried in vain to misleadingly frame her demise as self-determined. Armed with irrefutable proof, Authorities were finally able to apprehend Alan Hill Romero five days following the heinous crime on September 17th, denying him opportunity to evade the consequences of his monstrous actions. After the tragic event, Anna Maria's loved ones sought to educate the public about her true character. They depicted Anna Maria as a kind-hearted soul brimming with promise. Ever since her youth, she envisioned becoming a healer and worked relentlessly to gain entrance to the School of Medicine, as positions were extremely limited. Anna Maria immersed herself in her studies to fulfill her dreams, and in July 2023, she achieved her goal. In June, she ended a relationship of duration, and by July, she could embark on an entirely new chapter at her dream institution. Anna Maria's kin also communicated that she possessed a brilliant and magnificent spirit, charming all who encountered her. Her confidants cherished her dearly. These confidants furnished proof of Alan's culpability, dependent on the messages Anna Maria conveyed to them, and attested to the prosecution leading to Alan's arrest and trial. The confidants clarified the dynamic between Anna and Alan, 
recounting their interchanges at gatherings. Anna had expressed her concern regarding her beau on different events. It was obvious to everybody that Alan had become preoccupied with the girl. His unwholesome obsession, demonstrating through unreasonable gift-giving, could hardly be seen as standard. Anna Maria was well aware of Alan's controlling nature, having observed his possessive tendencies firsthand. Though an intelligent and resourceful young lady, she found herself unable to fully escape his domineering grip. The lively Colombian girl had always been athletic and in good health, taking after her sporty mother. With a Mexican father and Colombian mother, Anna Maria was a blend of both Hispanic heritages. She was passionate about dancing, especially enjoying lively rumba routines. Yet these dances only seemed to aggravate Alan's anger further, as watching Anna Maria smile and socialize with others during the celebratory music inflamed his jealousy. It was after one such dance that the full extent of Alan's obsession became frightfully clear. As he erupted in a volatile display, Anna Maria realized she could no longer endure his oppressive behavior. With a heavy heart, she knew she had no choice left but to end the toxic relationship before it consumed her. Those who knew Anna Maria Serrano, her loved ones and companions, will recall her as an insightful, charming girl with numerous hopes that, sadly, she will never get to accomplish. Her dreams and goals were shattered by an ex-sweetheart who couldn't acknowledge that she no longer cherished him. Merely eight days after Anna Maria's demise, Alan's mother posted a video message on social media, striving to justify her son's behaviors. She asserted he was a kind, intelligent, and reserved boy who deserved justice. However, she didn't articulate a single phrase about Anna Maria. The woman didn't push for an investigation into the case or the pursuit of the real criminal, and never discussed Anna Maria's death, despite being aware of the girl for many years. Throughout the entire video, she only protected her son, trying to persuade people not to fall for false information that could spread easily and lead to an unjust verdict. She only spoke of her son's kind nature and dedication to her studies. Unsurprisingly, Anna's relatives and friends reacted with fury to the video message from Alan's family, unable to believe the mother's stance. Rather than reach out to express sympathy for Anna's grieving parents at such a difficult time, she focused solely on defending her own child. Anna's mother found an inner resolve to address the public. Speaking in a measured yet resolute tone, she commended her lost daughter yet mentioned no ill will towards Alan. All she wanted was justice for the tragedy. Though she knew her girl could never return, law enforcement assured her Anna hadn't suffered at the end. Such destructive bonds must not be accepted as routine. Alan hiding behind a broken heart does nothing to condone her actions. Each person has autonomy over their relationships, and it must be clear that refusal demands respect. Guardians, mentors, and companions need to pay closer attention, recognizing when someone endures an abusive dynamic and requires aid to stop future tragedies of this nature from recurring. While Anna Maria Serrano's peculiar case remains under scrutiny, investigators continue compiling a diverse assortment of clues and leads into a coherent case file over the forthcoming eight weeks in preparation for the initial judicial proceeding. Thank you, dear friends, for watching. This has been Drake on the Crime Story Diaries channel. Please like and subscribe. Hello, loyal viewers. It's Drake once more with Crime Story Diaries. Youth often brings breakthroughs, explorations, affection, triumphs, and failures. Yet not for all. For some teenagers, this period brings out humanity's most frightening facets, sometimes causing crimes that shock with cruelty and callousness. Today we delve into a horrifying tale. Just a couple years prior, Samantha Grigg lived a regular teen life. She had the opportunity to stand out for her exceptional vocal skills. She truly had talent and every prospect of success. However, the night before her audition, her friend was discovered dead in the center of the street and she was accused of his murder. On the evening of February 15th, 2014, a distress call reached police in Smallbath Township, Michigan. 
A man drove the road when in the darkness he accidentally spotted an unmoving fellow near the roadside. The lone driver encountered a disturbing scene along the dark country road, a man lying lifeless and exposed. Approaching with caution, it was clear the poor soul displayed no signs of life. Wasting no time, emergency services were alerted of the grim discovery. The dispatcher calmly guided the Good Samaritan to check for vitals and make the wounded man comfortable till medical help arrived. Blue lights flashed in the distance as first responders raced to save whom they could. Arriving with haste, they detected a faint flutter beneath the still chest. All efforts were made to resuscitate the fallen figure, performing chest compressions and breathing life back into the vacant lungs. Rushed to the hospital under lights and sirens, the fight continued for dominance over death. Though the team battled with fervor, their skills could not win out over the Reaper's scythe. With the dawn came the sad news. The Jane Doe had been declared dead despite round-the-clock care. Doctors were left puzzled by the absence of clear injuries explaining the demise. Only through scrutiny of clues on and in the body would knowledge be gained of how tragedy had struck. The autopsy shed light on the ordeal endured. Abrasions upon abrasion covered the corpse from head to toe. Broken fingers revealed a struggle, hence his end was likely violent. In the end, it was twin fractures of the skull that stole away the breath, leaving more questions than answers. Soon, they had gradually uncovered clues leading to identification of the unfortunate crime victim. Among his possessions were papers revealing this young person to be Dustin Frolka, a mere teenager of 19 years from the adjacent community of Owasso, Michigan. Born in June of 1994 to common folk, Dustin came from modest roots. The sympathetic family left bereaved by this tragedy consisted of caring mother Sherry Frolka and father Louis Hinky, who doubtless would never have anticipated such a grim outcome for their boy. While their relationship had ended years prior, Dustin still enjoyed spending time with his father and stepmother. Having graduated high school, he began his sophomore year studying business management at Eastern Michigan University. However, his promising future was tragically cut short. Around the time of his college start, Dustin discovered he had an infant daughter from a past relationship. Though unmarried, he doted on his child from afar. Determined to provide stability, he dedicated spare moments to furthering his education and career in music. Under the stage name Difro, Dustin began to find local success, signing with an influential producer. Yet underneath the beginnings of achievement, trouble was mounting. Close friends noticed Dustin drinking more and using marijuana frequently. Legal issues emerged when he was arrested for possession in January. Expelled from campus housing, he moved in with associates. Concerns grew as Dustin tweeted about experimenting with hallucinogenic drugs. On the night of February 22nd, police arrived on scene to discover Dustin's body. His phone contained evidence of dealing sizable amounts of illicit substances. Three teenagers, Terrell Bredernitz, Brendan Heim and Samantha Grigg, were detained a week later in connection with the crime. Blood was found in Samantha's impounded vehicle, linking her to the events leading to Dustin's untimely demise. An investigation into Dustin's final days left more questions than answers about what caused his once promising path to suddenly spiral out of control. The talented young woman, Samantha Grigg, was a rising music star on the verge of success. However, her promising career was tragically cut short due to the vicious actions of three callous teenagers. In Samantha's car, the police found a folded knife that could have been used in the brutal murder. Additionally, the vehicle reeked powerfully of marijuana when the girl was arrested. Furthermore, during the thorough search, the officers discovered other illegal drugs, items belonging to the victim and musical equipment. The additional suspects were soon apprehended at their respective homes. The detained trio were connected through their shared attendance at the same high school. While one had recently graduated and started university, the second was nearing graduation, and Samantha had already completed her education. Phone records revealed that in the weeks leading up to the appalling incident, Samantha began communicating with the doomed rapper. 
it became evident through messages that all three teenagers played a role in the harrowing events leading to the rising star's untimely demise. In a misguided attempt to steal drugs from the musician, the heartless criminals savagely attacked him. After callously leaving him for dead, they brazenly disposed of incriminating evidence by burning it all. The malicious trio drove outside the city limits and set ablaze anything linking them to their heinous acts. Tragically, the thorough cleansing left investigators with no clues at the crime scene. While uncertainties remained around specific details, accumulated proof was sufficient to charge the three with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit armed robbery. It was clear their plan always included the additional crime of armed theft. Each perpetrator faced a life sentence due to the stated accusations. Following interrogations, examiners gained sufficient data to imprison the juvenile lawbreakers. All three faced charges with the aforementioned offenses. Samantha chose to strike the initial bargain, owning up to involuntary manslaughter and unarmed thievery in exchange for a more lenient sentence. In return, she agreed to testify against her accomplices, Brendan and Tyrell. By doing so, she not only reduced her sentence, but also gained the opportunity to be released early on parole. The pivotal aspect was that the girl had to furnish truthful testimony against her co-defendants. This helped the authorities uncover numerous gruesome details about the demise of the ascending rap celebrity. According to the girl on that fateful evening of February 15th, she received a call from Brendan, who requested her to give him a ride east of Lansing. Here, they were supposed to meet Tyrell and break into Distin's apartment. She didn't delve into the specifics of the plan, but simply agreed to drop off her friends and then wait for them further down the street. Despite their efforts, the thieves found no money in the afflicted man's living space, prompting them to guide Dustin into Samantha's automobile. Together, they toured various streets stopping near convenient cash locations for withdrawals. Initially, all progressed without difficulty, and the perpetrators exhibited no malice. However, when the artist neared home once more, Brendan maliciously accosted him from the back, delivering a severe pummeling. The assailant wielded knuckle dusters. Compelling Dustin to recognize escape was imperative. Forced to leap from the rapidly moving car at high speeds of roughly 100 kilometers per hour, he had suffered multiple impacts to the head previously, leaving no alternative but to hurtle himself from the rushing vehicle. Presumably, the youth supposed this desperate deed might liberate him. Thereafter, Samantha, witnessing the outcome, halted the auto, though not to assist the gentleman. Her accomplices disembarked and ransacked the sufferer. They pilfered substances and approximately $800 from Dustin while also kicking him. After that, the criminals simply abandoned him without providing aid, and the attack's prey was not fated to return alive to his abode. While Samantha received mere pocket change for her role in the heinous crime, the prosecutors argued that this plan had been calculatedly devised over time. On the night of the fateful party, Dustin's so-called friends conspired together, calling Samantha to join their sinister scheme. Though absent from the festivities, Samantha reluctantly agreed under peer pressure, initially believing it a petty act of vandalism or theft rather than murder. Yet when Dustin unexpectedly escaped the moving vehicle himself, the situation swiftly escalated beyond anyone's control. According to Samantha's defense, she had maintained a law-abiding life as a talented music student up until this catastrophic mistake. However, the grim details that emerged painted a more complicated portrait of her character than first assumed. Her potentially bright future in the industry now seemed sadly out of reach. While substances and prescribed medications were uncovered within her vehicle, intricately intertwined in the ruthless robbery and homicide, further inspection revealed her own consumption of such. Before the mourning relatives of the deceased situated within the courtroom, the defendant apologized and voiced deep regret regarding her role in these dreadfully misguided acts, emphasizing her designation as a chauffeur while others perpetrated the true malice. The girl conveyed remorse for the unfolding of such deleterious events. However, the victim's family presence saw beyond her vocalized repentance, doubting her claims of secondary involvement and believing her participation in the murderous endeavor was no less central or culpable than any other. 
she witnessed her so-called friends brutally beat the man within an inch of his life in the seat of the car, his muffled screams doing little to sway her silent approval of their savage actions. A myriad of emotions swirled within Samantha as the horrific scene unfolded. Jay, fear, disgust, horror, gee. Yet not once did she make a move to intervene. After stopping and dumping his body on the cold pavement like unwanted trash, the group dispersed and Samantha drove off into the night, her conscience haunted by the man's gurgling pleas for mercy. Though returning to provide aid or seeking help were options that could have saved an innocent life, she chose instead to preserve her own skin, leaving Dustin to perish alone on the side of the road under the cruel, uncaring stars. In her inaction, she helped snuff out a light that would never shine upon a daughter's face or bring joy to a grieving mother's heart. The double skull fracture was a mere formality. It was Samantha's cowardice that delivered the final, fatal blow. The victim's loved ones pleaded for the harshest punishment permissible by law against Samantha, despite no definitive evidence linking her directly to the killing. Throughout the witness statements, they centered primarily on the daughter, who would never again behold the extraordinary individual and gifted musician her father had been. Samantha possessed countless chances to avert the offense, to sway her confederates from their course, yet she failed to act. When these accusations rang out in the courtroom, the regretful young woman acquiesced with a bowed head, dabbing at her streaming eyes. Regardless, the departed's comrades believed the girl did not truly atone for her role in the reprehensible acts that stole away her father forever. The youthful performer expounded upon her designs following serving her phrase. She means to attend college and carry on examining music. Additionally, she hopes to advertise her efforts and assist adolescent individuals' progress in the musical path. However, this severely wounded the victim's lineage even more as they harshly accused Samantha of depriving Dustin of the opportunity to accomplish all that he aspired to achieve. Before the verdict was conveyed, the adjudicator perused several letters from sympathetic people. Some believed in demonstrating compassion to Samantha Grigg, while others hoped she would spend the rest of her life in jail. One of the enthusiasts of the deceased rap artist wished for Samantha to burn in heck. As a result, the vibrant lead vocalist of the nearby rock band was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Dustin's family agreed with this punishment. However, they noted that they had hoped for a more severe response to the criminal act. Nevertheless, they deemed the sentences for all the individuals involved in the crime to be equitable. After the crime, the young girl struggled with how to express herself on social media. Relatives of the victim felt her posts showed a lack of remorse and that she was merely feigning regret in court in hopes of a lighter sentence. In one post, Samantha shared her excitement about a new tattoo symbolizing that cash rules everything around me. Just prior to her legal troubles, the talented musician had been scheduled for an important audition with a reputable music label. However, due to the incident, she effectively destroyed any prospects for a future career in music. But as the prosecution stressed when consulting with the grieving family, her role in the offense was too severe to simply forgive and forget. When Samantha turns 24, she will first be eligible to apply for parole. For now, this grim prospect is the most hopeful outcome she can envision. Unlike the local rock band's lead singer, some of her co-conspirators faced even graver legal consequences. Tyrell, well known to law enforcement from numerous run-ins at his apartment in the 14 months preceding the murder, managed to evade punishment for over eight minor charges. The day hanging heavy with consequence, December 3rd saw Tyrell sentenced to 93 days for his forced entry into an automobile. Though he aimed only to procure possessions valued at but $200, the judge saw fit to grant probation in lieu of incarceration. Not wishing to hinder the boy's prospects, clemency was shown. Yet trouble soon found Tyrell once more, as accusations of multiple probation infractions brought him before the court again on January 13th. This time the judge delayed judgment until a subsequent hearing scheduled for the 24th of February. Between court appearances, the youthful lawbreaker managed through some unforeseen action to cross into forbidden territory, committing an act against Distin that should not have come to pass. 
much discussion and outrage arose from the leniency exhibited previously by the presiding magistrate towards one with a history of brushes against justice, who as a troubled teen may have been better served by stricter handling, thus perhaps preventing the tragedy that followed. This regretful situation could have been avoided by heeding past warnings. The benevolent magistrate hoped maintaining open dialogue might guide the wayward youth onto a more righteous path. However, his troubled charge remained unwilling to reform, no matter the compassion shown. While locked in debate whether rehabilitation remained possible, tragedy struck in the form of a life taken too soon. In the courthouse, the boy's unreliability and contradiction in values were decried as leading directly to heartbreak. Despite opportunities to mend his ways, he failed to learn from prior transgressions and is now forever marked as a killer. The presiding official believed the boy incapable of true harm, but underestimated the darkness within. By not reassessing prior leniency, another fell victim to violence on February 15th. Interestingly, just three days prior, a victim of the adolescence reported Tyrell's actions to the police. Living underneath the juvenile's apartment was a woman who had grown frustrated by the trash being discarded from above. One afternoon, after observing refuse flung from the window once more, she marched outside to confront the culprit. Upon exiting her residence, she encountered the teenager alongside his friends above and narrowly avoided an alcohol bottle tossed in her direction. This isolated incident on its own carried severe enough charges to place the young recidivist behind bars due to his flagrant violation of probation. On February the 12th, law enforcement arrived at the delinquent's home with the intention of clarifying the sequence of events. However, no response came after they rapped on the door. The officers returned disappointed to their vehicle waiting within the parking lot, keeping watch for the youth to venture out, though he never appeared that day. The accusations levied against him failed to warrant forcing entry and apprehension. As a result, the police drove off, leaving what transpired the following day inevitable and preventable. The next time the police came to question the juvenile delinquent was after Distin's brutal murder. At first, Tyrell denied any involvement, but later changed his story and cooperated fully with prosecutors in exchange for a reduced sentence. As stipulated in the plea agreement, he admitted guilt to second-degree murder and vowed to provide damning testimony against his accomplices in court. The young man then shifted blame entirely onto his friend. He recounted how Brendan had been the one to hatch the plan to rob and violently assault Distin from the very beginning. Tyrrell had been present in the back seat of the girl's car as a passive observer during the heinous crime. He witnessed in horror as Brendan produced a knuckle duster and savagely beat the defenseless victim sitting helpless in the front passenger seat. In a panic, Distin threw open the moving vehicle's door and tumbled out, suffering injuries that would soon claim his life. The car abruptly stopped, and the criminals hastily fled to search the body. Though badly injured and on the brink of death, Distin was still clinging to life. Callously, they opted not to offer aid, intent only on avoiding responsibility for their cruelty. According to Terrell's account, Brendan instructed him to abandon the defenseless victim. Rather than offering assistance, they removed some articles of his clothing in search of funds and valuables, stripping him even of his shoes. Thereafter, they hastily fled in Samantha's SUV. The perpetrators never summoned aid to try and preserve the victim's life. As a consequence, Terrell, complicit in Distin's murder, was sentenced to 38 years of incarceration with the possibility of parole after 25 years. He can first apply for release when he reaches 43 years of age. The 16-year-old adolescent Brendan also negotiated with the prosecution, admitting guilt to first-degree homicide. Despite being the youngest among the criminals, he was deemed the instigator of the murder according to testimonies of acquaintances. Brendan claimed that on February 14th, he and two others at his home planned this villainy in advance. They intended to take Distin, whom they knew had money, for a drive, make stops for him to withdraw funds from ATMs, and he conceived the idea to initiate the abuse right in the car, immediately starting the assault. The remorseful teenager struggled to provide any meaningful justification for his role in the malicious attack. 
During their investigation, it was discovered that Brendan's guardians had planned to seek psychiatric evaluation due to his unpredictable behavior. They noticed their child was acting unusually and wanted to ensure all was well, but sadly arrived at this resolution too late. The 16-year-old Brendan received the harshest penalty, sentenced to 60 years imprisonment with a possibility of parole after serving 32 years. The youngest participant in the brutal act was transported directly to prison upon reaching the age of majority. Though satisfied with the punishments meted out to the male assailants, the victim's family felt the female received too lenient a consequence. Distin's mother found it impossible to comprehend the senselessness of this crime, as the trio shattered her life and the lives of all close to the victims with their random violence. To this day, all involved in the offense remain incarcerated. Please share your perspective in the comments. Also, tap the like button if you found this account intriguing, but spare a thought for the devastation wrought upon the victims and their communities. Thank you for your time.
Hello everyone, it's Drake with you again. Terrifying nightmares, sinister secrets, and a bloody outcome, the disappearance of a family will reveal the terrible truth lurking beyond the confines of ordinary life. Revelations await you that will make you shudder with horror. Are you ready for the shocking secrets and heartbreaking events taking place in the dark corners of this house? Peek beneath the veil of history, where reality is worse than the cruelest fantasy. The exact date of birth of Fernando Reyes is impossible to give, but it is known that he was born, around 1983, in the village of Pampa Blanca, which is located in the department of El Carmen in the province of Jujuy in northeastern Argentina. He was the youngest of the five children of Arlen Dreyce and his wife, whose name history conceals. There are reports that Fernando's older brother was named Diego. Information about the childhood and adolescence of the hero of our story is very little. Nevertheless, people who knew him in adulthood agree that he was quite silent. In 2008, Fernando, who at that time was over 20, met 14-year-old Dana Bellen Martinez. Despite the significant age difference, the young people quickly found a common language. Born in 1994, in the same village, Dana was closely associated with the Rice family. She was known as a cheerful, energetic, and positive girl. Her smile never left her face, and with her optimism, she energized everyone around her. Dana was attracted to nightlife, so she often went to parties. Friendship between her and Fernando quickly developed into a serious relationship and they began to live together. The girl found a place in the municipality of Pampa Blanca, and her chosen one earned a living working in a cab service. In 2014, the couple had their firstborn child, and after another three years, a second child was born. The names of the children have not been disclosed for their personal safety. In 2018, Fernando and Danu quit their jobs, packed their bags and left the province in search of new opportunities. And they didn't inform anyone, not even close family members, of their decision. After traveling a little over 700 kilometers, the couple stopped in the province of La Rioja. Fernando took a job as a walnut harvester. Working hard, he gradually began to receive a good income. Then the material condition of the family improved. Only a year and a half after the move, the couple contacted Fernando's relatives and told them about their new place of residence. They shared their impressions about the changes in their lives and assured that they were doing well. After that, Fernando began to keep in touch with his mother and often turned to her for help, especially when there were problems in his relationship with Dana. Even though the man kept telling his loved ones about the family's well-being, there was actually a whole different world behind the happy external picture. At the beginning of their history, both Fernando and Dana often changed jobs, which seriously affected the family budget. As a result, the couple was evicted from La Rioja. Not desperate, they moved to La Cienaga, in the department of Bellum. In this tiny village with a population of less than 50 people, Dana and Fernando rented a modest house owned by a man named Jace Cruz. As soon as they settled into their new place, neighbors learned of the family's difficult financial situation. Despite the fact that the villagers themselves were not rich, they organized a fundraiser to help the newcomers with clothes, shoes, and food. Fernando and Dana were immensely grateful to them. Among the couple's new acquaintances were Maria del Volevalagra and Simon Alcide Starnanis, with whom they became friends. Fernando also began to get close to Hase, and it became common to see them together with conversations and drinks. Meanwhile, the relationship between Fernando and Dana was rapidly deteriorating, and this, of course, did not go unnoticed by the neighbors. When disagreements became almost an everyday occurrence, the partners decided to separate, but Fernando could not give up the children and they continued to live under the same roof. Over time, Dana stooped to threats and warned the man that if he wanted to leave her and the children, she would immediately report to the police, accusing him of violence. This behavior of the woman further complicated the relationship between them. Fernando, as is his custom, called his family and told them about the situation, including Dana's threats and his desire to divorce her, his parents, who were in Jujuy, were concerned about the problems in their son's family, 
but did not know how to help him. Meanwhile Dana did not sit idly by, and soon began to closely communicate with another man, already familiar to Fernando. It was Simon Alcede Staranzus, and he was 27 years old. Every weekend they went dancing, sometimes in the company of Simon's ex-girlfriend Maria and her new partner. Dana's defiant behavior only exacerbated the conflict. In late November 2022, Haas, the owner of the couple's rented house, suggested that Fernando meet on Sunday, December 4th, to celebrate a celebration in honor of the Virgin del Valle de Catomarca, which was to last until December 8th. Encouraged, Fernando accepted the invitation, and on the night of Saturday to Sunday, December 3rd, there was a dance at the San Roga Club. Dana went there in the company of Simon and Maria. When she met Fernando, she got into the usual altercation, which quickly turned into a heated argument. The neighbors witnessed the scene, but they did not intervene. At some point, Fernando, disheveled and angry, decided to leave. He headed toward a field that was not far from the church route. In a secluded area, he was suddenly attacked. Dana, Simon, and Maria, who struck him at least two blows to the head with a blunt object. Fernando fell and died almost instantly. The perpetrators then lit a bonfire and threw the body into it. One of the residents and La Cienaga noticed the flames of the fire in a field, but did not pay much attention to what he saw. After a while, it became clear that the flames had not completely destroyed the body, so the trio placed the remains of their victim in bags and went to the bank of the Bielan River. Here, they dug two holes, one for each garbage bag. After burying the body, Dana, Maria, and Simon returned to the party. There, amidst the music, drinks, and merriment, they remained quiet, neither remembering what they had done nor arousing the suspicion of the locals. Sunday, December 4th, Hase waited for his friend Fernando to throw the party as they had agreed, but time passed and he never showed up. An agitated Hase contacted Dana to find out what had happened. She replied that Fernando had gone to Jujui to visit his family. The man hung up the phone in bewilderment and embarrassment. He could not understand why a friend would do such a thing without even informing him. Days went by, but Fernando did not contact him. Hase couldn't let go of the thought that something bad had happened. He turned to Dana again, looking for an explanation. That's right, yes, she had told him that they had decided to separate. This only added to the confusion of the mysterious story, as Fernando didn't pick up the phone or respond to the message that Hase had sent him. Meanwhile, neighbors also thought it was strange that the loud arguments in the couple's home suddenly stopped. Besides, no one had seen Fernando in the past few days. Suddenly, Dana told Jace that Fernando had returned to the province of La Rioja and found a well-paying job there, similar to the one he had before. The more, however, she tried to avoid uncomfortable questions, the more ambiguous and unconvincing her answers became. As a result, Dana's contradictory accounts sowed doubt in Hayes. Soon, the man became convinced that his intuition had not failed him. As the weeks progressed, the children also began to notice their father's absence. Unsuspecting, they turned to their mother with questions. Dana told them the terrible news. Their dad had died and was buried near the river. The bewildered children, not quite realizing what was happening, began to bring flowers to the place of their father's death. Meanwhile, Haas decided to talk to the neighbors, hoping to shed some light on Fernando's disappearance. Two residents said they had seen the couple arguing at a party. Later, another resident recounted the night's bonfire, admitting he hadn't reported it to the authorities. Dana, on the other hand, continued to lie to Fernando's relatives, saying that he had left her with the children and moved away. Moreover, she started demanding money from them to raise the babies. However, there was still a long way to go before the crime she had committed was exposed. The story woven by Dana, Simon, and Maria concealed a gruesome truth that no one knew about. In mid-April 2023, Hase, who never stopped striving to find out the truth, tried to find out. Had Fernando really returned to Jujui to his relatives? On social media, he managed to find Diego, Fernando's older brother. Hase wrote a message on his wall expressing his concern 
and offered to help him find the truth if needed. Diego simply ignored the disturbing message and then blocked the man altogether. The failed attempt didn't stop Huss. On the contrary, he was even more persistent in his quest for answers. Writing to the missing man's sister, the man failed again, as she too did not believe his words. By the end of April, a ball had been organized in Santa Maria, a two-hour drive from La Cienaga. Dana and Fernando were on the guest list. The woman had left the children at home, locking them up. As soon as she appeared alone at the feast, the attendees became worried. They hadn't seen Fernando since November, and now he wasn't at the ball either. At the same time, Heisei heard crying coming from the rented house, since he was the owner he had spare keys. When he went inside, he saw small children left unattended. The little girl clearly relayed to him what their mother had told them. It was like a spark and a good reason to contact the police. On May 5th, 2023, Heisei finally reported Fernando missing. The investigation was transferred to the prosecutor's office. Immediately afterwards, a large-scale search operation was launched, involving homicide experts, criminalists, and canines sent from the capital. The first day brought no results, but during the second day of the search, bone remains were found in an open place. On May 5th, Dana was brought to the station for questioning. The team arrived at the woman's house, met by the eldest son. As he repeated the story told by his little sister, the investigators focused on the search in the area adjacent to the river. During the interrogation, Dana adhered to her previous version of Fernando's move to Jujuy. Now she said that the reason for the departure was the death of her brother, Diego. The police contacted the relatives of the missing man to confirm the information. After speaking with Diego, it became apparent that Dana's testimony was false. She was arrested. On May 7th, canines marked a specific place in the area of the search operation, which was pointed out by Fernando's son, and the team made every effort to quickly solve the mystery and the disappearance of the man. During the excavation, a black plastic bag was discovered, and inside were remains, approximately five pounds, and in a state of decomposition. Forensic medics later confirmed that these were indeed human remains. Given the seriousness of the events, Attorney General Alexandre Alasta arrived at the scene along with a team of forensic scientists and criminal investigation officers. To confirm the identity, the found fragments were sent to the forensic medical laboratory. The news of the discovery forces Dana to talk. She confessed to the murder when she was told that if she kept quiet, she would probably get a life sentence. The interrogation in the presence of the prosecutor lasted about eight hours. The suspect tried to mitigate the circumstances in her favor and claimed she acted in self-defense. Her final version was that 39-year-old Fernando was harassing her. According to the woman, she decided to hit him. While not intending to take his life, the force of the blows Dana did not calculate and realizing that she had inadvertently killed her former partner, she panicked and decided to destroy the traces of the crime. In addition, she ruthlessly ratted out her accomplices. In the early morning of May 18th, 2023, at the end of the interrogation, the prosecutor charged Dana with three counts of murder with particular cruelty, cruelty in the commission of a crime and assisting two or more persons in the commission of a crime. And the woman was taken into custody at the police station in Bellany. As for Maria and Simon, they were charged with murder with particular cruelty, with a leader with a group of two or more persons. Both were placed in police custody in the police stations in Beleni, pending a meeting with the prosecutor and providing their versions of events, which were then to be verified with the story told by Dana. As part of the investigation, the cell phones of all the suspects were sent to the forensic laboratory, where they were thoroughly analyzed calls, personal messages, photos, videos, and other materials. Fernando's relatives were depressed. The cold-bloodedness with which Dana committed her act amazed them. In addition, they had to face a difficult test, or rather a trip to cooperate with the investigation. There, among other formalities, they provided DNA samples, and only seeing their children was of some comfort to the dead man's loved ones. 
their maternal grandmother took custody of them. On May 18th, Simon and Maria, represented by the same lawyer, appeared before the prosecutor. Both categorically denied any involvement in what had happened, and the lawyer noted that it was impossible to focus on DNA evidence alone, and therefore the evidence of his client's guilt was not convincing enough. A few days later, the defense filed a request for the results of psychological and psychiatric evaluations based on a review of the contents of the suspect's phones. On May 31st, the 3rd Judicial District Guarantee Control judge granted this request, and the preliminary hearing was suspended. The prosecutor then insisted that all three remain in custody pending DNA appointments, given the seriousness of the crimes. There was a possibility that the trial would be heard by a jury. Diego, Fernando's brother and his father appeared in court to join the prosecutor's side, represented by counsel. The trial was originally scheduled for June 13th, 2023, but has since been postponed. Unknown at this time is the next tentative date when the three accused in the murder of Fernando Reyes will have to answer for their horrific act. The relatives of the deceased hope for justice, but the children from now on will have to grow up without a father and mother, realizing that it was the mother who was the perpetrator of a brutal crime that destroyed their family. This case was a vivid confirmation that sometimes the people we trust the most are actually our worst enemies, just waiting for the right moment to reveal their sinister nature. At the same time, it's a sad reminder that when breaking up, it's important to keep your distance and avoid conflicts that can lead to tragic consequences like the ones I told you about. Thank you for watching. I recommend you to watch other trumpet stories. Click right now. And also, don't forget to click on the bell so you don't miss new stories. See you soon. Take care.